Hello, and we continue our discussion here at Radical Engagements of Adrian Richard's essay, Raya Denyskaya's Marx. Um, you can find it in um, a collection of Adrian Rich essays, uh, which I believe is called uh, The Art of the Possible. I may even have that around here. But I found it in the Pelgrivet, Mill, and Marx, Ingalls, and Marxisms series, Rod Dennis Gaia's Antisexual Marxism, Race, Class, Gender, and the Dialectics of Revelation. I would strongly suggest you watch the other two videos in the series uh, before watching this one. <clears throat> We're on page 99, if you are following along in the text. But neither did Marx idealize egalitarian communal society. He saw that, quote, the elements of oppression in general and of women in particular rose from within primitive communism, not only related to change from the matriarchy, but began with the establishment of ranks, relationships of chief to mass, and with the economic interests that accompanied it, unquote. He watched closely how the family evolved into an economic unit, wood in which they received the slavery and serfdom, how tribal conflict and conquest led toward slavery and the acquisition of property, but where Ingalls posited, quote, the world historic defeat of the female sex, Ingalls didn't say that as a good thing. Daniel Skaya notes that Marx saw resistance of women in every revolution, not simply how they were disempowered by the development of patriarchy and by European invasion and colonization. <laughs> Resistance implies defeat. This is where I'm talking. I mean, it doesn't apply eternal defeat. It doesn't apply being beaten down. But it does imply if you're resisting, you are losing or have lost. Doesn't mean you'll stay losing. It doesn't mean you will lose the long duray. But it means that the immediate fight has been lost. And so that opposition has never totally made sense to me. Anyway. The ethnological notebooks are crucial to Dunyasaya's eyes because they show Marx at a point in his life where his ideas of revolution were becoming even more comprehensive. The colonialism that have evolved out of capitalism forced him to return to the pre-colonial societies to study human relations and, quote, to see the possibility of new human relations, not as it might come through as a mere updating of the primitive communism's equity of the sexes, but as Marx sensed that they would burst forth from a new type of revolution, unquote. Asterisk. This is why I think talking about social reproduction, production, and relationality is really important for communists beyond just like talking about, you know, empowering workers or class collaboration. And people who talk, who come at me like, oh, you know, we need to work together with the other classes. And I'm like, hmm, yeah. See how that's gone in the past. Anyway. Back to the text. Dunyaskaya vehemently opposes the notion that Marx is Marxism means that class struggle is primary. Uh, yeah, it is primary. I'm sorry. Whenever they try to, like, no, it's not that... Marx doesn't think this other stuff is possible until you've done away with classes, period. It is primary. Doesn't mean that the other... Th it's not... Everything can't be reduced to it. It is primary. Or that racism or male supremacism will end when capitalism falls. I think that's fair. I think Marx is aware that that's not going to be easy. What happens after, she says in a question we have all we've been asking all along, and this she sees in the women's liberation movement, both women of color and white women have insisted on asking. And indeed, what is finally so beautiful and compelling about Marx is she shows us in his resistance to all static, stagnant ways of being, the deep appreciation of motion and transformation as principles of thoughts and of human processes, that the mind-weaving dialectical shuttle of flight in the loom of human activity. Raya Danyaskaya caught fire from Marx, met it with her own fire, brought it to the events of her lifetime and revitalized, refocused Marxism. Her writings, with all the passion, energy, and wit and learning, 
may read awkwardly at times because she's really writing against the grain of how many readers have learned to think to separate disciplines and genres, theory from practice. She is trying to think and write the revolution in revolution. Anyone who's tried to do this in any medium knows the effect is not smooth or seamless. I agree with that. Rosa Luxemburg may not fit the expectations of many readers schooled in leftist, feminist, or academic thought. It is, first of all, not a conventional biography, but rather a history and critique of a woman's, of a thinking woman's mind. It supplies no anecdotes of Luxemburg's childhood, no dramatic versions of her assassination. It does, however, explore the question of how Luxemburg's sexual and political relationship with Leo Jokic. Joe Kitches, I don't know, J-O-G-I-C-H-E-S, I have no idea how to say that name, expressed itself in both intimate letters and in her theory. But Luxembourg's central relationships in Donia Saya's eyes were her intellectual relationships with the work of Marx as she understood it and the relationship of her whole self to the revolution. Most biographers of women still fail to recognize the woman's central relationship to, to be her work, even as lovers come and go. And Dunya Skyas doesn't end the book with Luxembourg's death because she doesn't see the death as an ending. She goes on to throw out lines of thinking for the future, lines that pass through Luxembourg's fiery fingers, but don't finish with the woman who, quote, joyfully threw her whole life on the scales of destiny. Quote, no one knows where the end of suffering will begin, writes Nadine Gordimer about the 1976 Sawado children's uprising in her novel, Berger's daughter. In her 1982 essay, quote, Living in the Interregnum, she muses about the sources of art and goes on, quote, it is from there and the depths of being that the most important intuition of every revolutionary face comes. The people know what to do before the leaders. Danyskaya concludes, so, I couldn't tell. I guess that her in that sentence is actually uh, Dennis Guy. It looks like it's Nadine Gordimer, the way it's written. Anyway, Dennis Guy concludes, quote, this is a long quote. It isn't because we are smarter that we see how much more than the other post-Marx Marxists, rather that it's because of the maturity of our age. It is true that other post-Marx Marxists have rested on the truncated Marxism. It is equally true that no other generation could have seen the problematic of our age, much less solve our problems. Only human beings can recreate the revolutionary dialectic a new emphasis in the text emphasis by rich i'm just reading the notes and these live human beings must do so in theory as well as practice it is not a question only in meeting the challenges from practice but of being able to meet the challenge of self-development of the idea that's capitalized and of deepening theory to the point that reaches marx's concept of philosophy of revolution and permanence and this work is indeed going on. Chicana lesbian feminist poet, activist, and theorist Gloria An Anzaldúa writes in 1990. I told you I bet this is from the 90s. Anyway, back to text. Long quote from Gloria Anzaldúa. I think. What does what? Does being a thinking subject and intellectual mean for a woman of color from the working class origin? Ellipses. It means being concerned about the ways knowledges are invented. It means continually challenging the institutionalized discourses. It means being suspicious of the dominant culture's interpretation of our experience and the way they read us. Ellipses. Ellipses. Theory produces the effect that change, that change people and the way they perceive the world. Thus, we need a theory us to enable us to interpret what happens in the world. A theory us, I'm pronouncing it that way because that's written, it's left in, it's left untranslated from the Spanish. I don't know if that's in the original. It probably is. And I'm, I'm, I'm assuming it's left there because both, you know, because Chicana Spanish, but also the Spanish use of the, of the term is closer to the Greek use. Anyway, back to the text. That will explain how and why we relate to certain people in specific ways that will reflect what goes on between the inner, outer, and perpetual eyes within the person, and between the personal eyes and the collective we of our ethnic communities. Necessitemos theorias. 
the necessary theory that's Varn translating that from Spanish, that will rewrite history using race, class, gender, and ethnicity as categories of analysis, theories that cross borders, that blur boundaries. We need theories that point out the ways to maneuver between our particular experiences and the necessity of, form of forming our own categories and theoretical models for the patterns we uncover. We need to find the practical application from those theories. We need to give up the notion that there is a correct way to write theory. I do like uh, this as a theory of being, but I will just point out that this is very much of 1990s thinking. <laughs> um, and thus actually pretty close to the way a lot of like what we might call radical liberals think today. I don't think everything in this is bad, by the way. I just think like, you know, we need race to rewrite history using race, class, gender, and ethnicity. So we use the categories used to process to rewrite and rethink through those categories, I guess. Except there's no attempt to sublate and move past them implied in this text as we're given. Now, I haven't read the original text. In fact, I don't even see um, which text this is from. This is a long quote, but I don't see the citation. Yeah, it's not, there's no citation. This was uh, frustrating. This was an art, artistic essay, not an academic one. Uh, but I would love to know exactly where this comes from, since there's also indications that a whole lot of it is taken out. There's a ton of ellipses in here. Anyway. Back to Adrian Rich. It's made so difficult under prevailing conditions of capital shaped priorities, male supremacism, racism, militarism to envision that the revolution without end to which Dunya Skaya devoted her life. Most of us, even in our imagination, settle for less. Agreed. Living under these conditions, we can lose sight of the fact that we live, that we, live human beings, excuse me, are where it all must begin. Lose sight, even to the point of denying the degree to which we are suffering. At certain moments, if we are lucky, we turn to experience the flash of how it would feel to be free. Raya Dunyaskaya clearly would never let go of her expectations of the fullness of being human, of how it would feel. And she wanted to experience the normal experience of every human being everywhere. One of the things that I get from the end that completes the essay, one of the things I get from this Adrian Rich essay is the way in which there is a romanticism to the standpoint view in which we can inhabit these categories that were used to oppress us and divide us and separate us out. But we can inhabit them somehow as liberational categories and not transcend them. And there is no push in Rich's essay. There isn't Danya Skaya, but there's no push in Rich's essay to move us past it. You know, one of the things about the, about the revolution and then you can see this in the kind of radical feminism. And I, and I brought up in the last episode that Rich uh, was cited in a 1979 book called Transsexual Empire by Janice Rudman. And it is, it was, it was basically, you know, um, it was basically radical feminism, uh, what, you know, we would call turfy before that was even a category. It's from 1979. And Rich was cited in the chapter called Sappho by Surgery. Um, one of the things that has come out is Rich was supportive of the work, although um, she, I don't find a, hot, a whole lot of explicit anti-trans stuff in the stuff I've read by Rich, but I haven't read all of Rich. I've read, I think I've read all of her poetry, but I haven't read all of her essays. Um, but I found this frustrating because Daniel Skaya is obviously talking about things beyond, I mean, in a very Hegelian sense, beyond the individual subjectivity, which the individual subjectivity is moved by your age and the collective knowledge of the age. Whereas Rich keeps on pulling it back to the individual experience and the way in which we embody these categories and see new things from our standpoints. Now, I've done things in the past where I talked about the way Lukash is. Uh, um, history and class consciousness was actually used by Marxist feminists to generate standpoint epistemology, but which dropped a lot of the like ontological and Marxist assumptions in history and class consciousness to make standpoint epistemology. Um, and you see this from you know 
uh, a bunch of thinkers. Um, and this is assumed in Rich, all right? And it's assumed in who a lot of the people Rich is is citing. So, like, um, Sandra, Har uh, Sandra Harding, I very much hear here about, you know, objections to strong objectivity. Um, uh, Har Nancy Harstock. Uh, Dorothy Smith, to a lesser degree, Donna Haraway, who I, who I think is a little bit more interesting. Um, where standpoint epistemology is viewed as like, you know, you perceive things from your lens, and because you're unique lens, you see truths that other people don't see. And this is not, and this, you know, this leads you to have, to valorize those positions as positions in themselves, but there is no movement in this to go beyond those positions. There's no, like, one of the things that you would critique, not in Donna Haraway, I think on Haraway you're dealing with someone different, but one of the things that was constantly critiqued about the use of Marxism in, the, in this kind of view of identity policies is it valorizes those positions but doesn't try to abolish them at all. Um, now, I'm going to stay away from like gender abolition versus sex abolition because those things have meant different things in different times. Um, and it's beyond the scope of this essay ex exactly. But it's interesting to me how there's a push beyond that in Danyaskaya, but Rich keeps on pulling it back, pulling it back to a kind of like, we just need to more fully embody more voices of the world and we are live human beings. And as live human beings, we're also these collectivities that are represented as the individual animized human. And maybe I'm reading the individual animized human, but there's this liberalism in that, this um, kind of standard animized view that sees a collective as manifested in the individual, but utter, you're still the individual. You're not relationally building now that said i think in rich there is a tension there there is this realization of relational building and both concepts kind of emerge in rich's analysis of Danyaskaya, but they don't they, they are actually in opposition to each other and they don't direct since they're not brought out in direct opposition to each other the contradiction is not recognized there's no attempt to move past it it's just sort of you're left in the tension of that contradiction, all right, in, in the Hegelian sense of the term contradiction. I find that interesting, and I find it interesting also because one of the things that Danyuskaya points out is, like, we can't see beyond our own time, even if we're trying to answer questions beyond our own time, right? Um, and when I'm listening to Rich, Rich is kind of, in some ways... You know, like, oh, you know, all that Marxist stuff, you know, there's there's a Marx that's redeemable and good, and we can see this in the ethnological notebooks, and but also it's really outdated, and we're better than that now. And yet, I bet you as I read this, you a lot of my audience is going to be, not just because, I, I have females in my audience and, and feminists in my audience, it's not just because we're Marxists, but a lot of this is going to feel more dated than a lot of the stuff that she's saying is dated. Because we are in a different context. Now, Rich critiqued white feminism. And like, like I said, white feminism was what a lot of Marxists would call bourgeois feminism. Um, very much the same way that like Bell Hooks talked in her work. Um, but one of the reasons why they probably don't say bourgeois feminism, because these are people of immense privilege. Not Andre Lord, but Adrian Rich. Uh, um, was born to the chairman of pathology at John Hopkins. And her mother was a concert pianist and composer. Um, and while she was uh, of Ashkenazi Jewish heritage to her father, she was raised um, a Southern Protestant. Uh, 
So, you know, I mean, these are not people without privilege. I mean, uh, Rich was to embrace her Jewish identity, she, you know, she was to embrace the oppressed sides of herself. Um, but there is a way in which it is very clear she's also like one of the reasons why she doesn't want to talk about class. I mean, it's a little bit obvious. <laughs> Maybe that's unfair. Um, after all, someone can throw their lot in with any class and with other struggles. I mean, absolutely. But it does seem particular that, I don't know, very well off silent generation intellectuals would downplay class in their analysis of oppression. It's, it's not a very big thing to do. I don't think that that means that all their critiques of of male chauvinism, etc. I think it's interesting she talks more about male chauvinism than patriarchy. I wonder if that's a particular thing of the 90s. Um, but anyway, uh, her critiques of male chauvinism are, are erasure of race differences and stuff. I, I don't think that makes that invalid, right? That someone might have reasons for not being completely upfront about everything they are doesn't mean that her critiques about other things are invalid. Um, but it does something you it is you know it is something you should think about i uh, i think this is interesting as a study about getting to like the way the new left kind of transitioned into what led into the left of Occupy, etc remember like i said adrian rich died she was 82 years old i mean she wasn't young but she died roughly um you know right like right in the middle of Occupy. I remember like even talking about it actually. Um, I think I was talking to, uh, a f back when I was still a professor back in those days, I was talking to an English um, uh, interpretation and translation English department colleague in Korea about her death uh, after one of the events at Occupy Yoido. So, you know, I remember it kind of vividly. This is a lot of things to think about, about how we came to where we are now. And also this tendency, I, I really don't like this. Like, I don't think there's one tendency to pretend that Ingalls and Marx are like one Borg person. And honestly, like the journalism stuff, they kind of are. But in theory, there's slight differences. And I do think the ethnological notebooks in the, in the late writings is where those differences kind of show up. But in another way, there's a there's this attempt to turn Ingles, Ingles into the villain of everything. Like, oh, he's the reason why Marx is a Promethean. He's the reason why um, Marxist feminism was insufficiently feminist. He's the reason why uh, the economic manuscripts are screwed up, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Except every time that you dig deep, it doesn't seem like that's the case. Like, there might be slight differences. Uh Ingalls was more of a naturalized Hegelian than Marx in some sense, in that he literally thought you could do science through Hegelian philosophy. Marx doesn't denounce that, but he doesn't attempt to do it in the same way. Um, but that tendency, and that tendency lasted into the aughts, all right? I'm going to go in, in my critique of the Goethe series, I'm nailing it down. I'm going to talk about how they were still blaming Ingalls for shit well into the aughts, even though Ingalls indulges everything in critique of the Goethe program. Um, of the draft program, if you want to call it by its real name. Um, a critique of the draft program. Anyway, my point being that this very much feels of a certain time. And also it's interesting because in a lot of ways, time is not, like, time hasn't been super kind to Rich, even though she's not been dead that long. I mean, if she was alive today, she would be 93 years old, you know, um, but she's been dead a little over, uh, a decade now. And like I said, she was a major influence on my poetic work. And she was, she was one of the first radical feminists I read her and Andre Lord, because I, I came to them and then I read bell hooks and all that stuff too. I came to them through poetry. Um, I also read all the French Lacanian feminist, which I think maybe is why I hate Lacan. But nonetheless, I don't hate Lacan, but it's why 
have a complicated emotions about the car. So in some ways, this is a flashback to my early college days. I read this stuff in undergrad. Um, I did not know Dunyaskaya in undergrad. I became familiar with Dunyaskaya's work between 2009 and 2015. And I see a lot of limits in Dunyaskaya's work, if I'm quite honest. But I also do see genius and a real attempt to like think through things, um, an attempt to have an inclusive view. There's also an attempt to like distance her traditional Marxism from the other Marxism. There's an attempt to make the rough edges squeaky clean. I don't think you can really do that. I don't know if it helps you to do it either. Now, I've given almost as much commentary as at the end of this uh, as I ever do. So I'm going to wrap this up. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Don't start with this one. And if you got this far and you started with the end of the essay, you probably don't know what I'm talking about. Go watch the other two videos. Like and subscribe. Hit the bell. We have a Patreon. I do more of this on the Patreon side. I do more of everything. I do Q&As. I only do a few public Q&As a year, but I do a Q&A roughly every month on the Patreon. Um, there's additional episodes. There's all the archives. There's over like 400 episodes. There's probably several like a year's worth of listening, even though I've only been around as an independent podcaster for three years. I've been doing podcasts for a lot longer, though, and that's part of why there's so much material there. It's also my archives for all the podcasts I've done have been taken down over time, like Symptomatic Redness or Former People or what else did I do? Stuff not owned by Zero Books. Um, it's all on there. Uh Oh, I mean, uh, the entirety of Mortal Science is available both on its own Patreon and here. Support which one you'd like. All right. Uh, thank you so much. Have a great day. Um, we're out.